Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. Today I sit down with professional dog trainer, Oscar Mora. He is a certified decoy in French ring, Mondial ring, as well as IGP. As a competitor in Mondial ring, he has the only Mondial ring titled Connie Corso in the United States. He has decoyed many French ring competitions, two Mondial ring nationals, and one IGP regional championship. With his dog Guapo, he has passed the protection dog certification in PSA and has won two IGP three Western regionals. He has been training dogs professionally for 11 years and founded his dog training business, Elevated Canine Academy in 2016. So without further ado, please welcome the one and only Oscar Mora. All right, thanks for coming down, buddy. I really appreciate it. So first, what I would like to do is introduce you to my audience. Tell them a little bit about yourself, your dog training experiences, where you learned, how you've gotten to where you started out, to where you are now, maybe even a little bit of your dog training philosophies and principles. Cool. Uh, started dog training uh, around 11 years ago. I got a Connie Corso, and that was kind of a, you know, there was all these stories going around of these dogs that attacked these two ladies up in San Francisco. And so when I got this Corso, I had never owned a dog before, living at my parents, and I was like stressed out because I was, you know, uh, I thought this dog was going to be aggressive and, you know, I didn't know anything about dogs. So long story short, got the dog. Uh, I found this guy that was doing Schutzen, old, old uh, German dude. Before I got the dog, I found him uh, driving down to the freeway in the 405 and I stopped by. I was like, hey, Pete. Uh, well, now that I know, I was like, hey, I want to learn about dogs. And he was like, uh, yeah, you can come and hang out and, you know, see if... Uh, if you know something you like so anyways fast forward uh six months later i got my dog and i was there for six months going uh, every tuesday and thursday to his uh trainings or whatever and he would yell at me uh you know he had a club yeah he had like a little a little schutzen club uh with a lot of show shepherds and stuff like that and uh so anyways uh fast forward i i met uh, this guy named steve garvin he was into mondial ring and he was training with a guy named oj knighton who I had already seen on Caesar Milan on the, on the show. And I was like, oh yeah, I know that dude. And he was like, yeah, you know, I give him your name, call him, and uh, you know, maybe you can go out there and see what they're doing and maybe you could be into some of that stuff. So I called OJ, I got out there and put me in the suit first time out. Never, you know, never been in a bite suit, threw me in the bite suit and uh, told me to run and sent this, this Mondio, uh, Mondio Ring 3 dog on me named Bogan, send him on me, freaking drop me, uh, and was I was hooked. A, was it a uh, Doberman? It was a Malinois. Oh, it was a Malinois? Yeah, it was a Malinois. He was a beast, man. And uh, so anyways, I was hooked since then. From there, I jumped into, you know, French Ring, did French Ring for a while. Uh, I think that's where I really uh, learned more of my decoying abilities, you know, and when you do French Ring, you got to learn how to move a certain way. And then I went back and got certified in Mondio Ring, and then I got certified in uh, Schutzen IGP. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how the, the sport thing went, happened. So your introduction into the dog training world was competitive protection sports. Correct. That is very interesting. Correct. I so mean, you... <laughs> outside before that, I was really I wasn't really into dogs. I grew up in the hood, but I never had like my own dog before that. You know, before uh, before my Connie Corso. Well, it's, it's really cool that the foundation work that you have in dog training is a competition sport or protection sports in general. What people often don't realize is when you train to the very top level, which competition obedience, competition sports, that is the top level when it comes to communicating with the dog, making sure your delivery is clear and working together as a team, something I talk about quite often. Right. To start there, it probably made everything else seem very easy in right. a sense. So like once you started taking on your pet clients and things like that, that obedience had to be yeah, like, I mean, what uh, what happened was that I mean, what, what the guy, the old German dude I started with, that was all pretty much yank and crank, uh, you know what I mean? Escape avoidance, yeah, style just training. escape avoidance stuff, and uh, you know, however, he did try to you know motivate the dog a little bit and have you know. So how explain it, what uh, escape avoidance style training is to people I mean, who don't know. You know, compulsion based. You correct the dog into doing whatever behavior you want him to do. You know, you add pressure until the dog does whatever you ask, and you know. You reward him when he does it with relieving pressure. Uh, so he was still rewarding, 
but he was teaching the behaviors by using compulsion, which yeah, is yeah. corrections. Exactly. It was a little bit, uh, you know, less of uh, teaching the dog how to work for him, more so, hey, you're going to do what I tell you to do. Um, however, I, I, I feel uh, very, uh, I'm blessed to come into, get, I got into dog training at a time where, you know, Learberg was putting a lot of Michael Ellis stuff out and, and all that. And I really, you know, and since I got into Mondial Ring, I learned about Michael Ellis because that's what he was doing at the time. So I, I found that, um, you know, I really liked his style of training and really motivated me to keep wanting to learn more about dog training rather than just stick to what I first learned, mm -hmm. you know. Being open-minded to new t techniques yep, or new philosophies. Exactly. So what is your dog training philosophies and principles? What structure do you follow when it comes to training a dog, regardless of what you're training them for? I would say the first thing is, you know, get a dog motivated, figure out the dog, uh, what he likes, and, you know, create a good relationship that way. Uh, once you have a dog that wants to interact with you and is motivated, want to work for you, it's very easy sometimes to teach behaviors. Uh, rather, if you're trying to get a dog to work for you and try to get a, you know, a dog to do things for you when he's checking out all the time, it just doesn't work. So uh, for me, the first thing I want to do is make sure that the dog is focused and wants to work for me. Uh, how, how you accomplish that, there's different ways. I usually do it through food. Um, you know, I cut their food a little bit. I bring in, you know, higher value food, you know, maybe like some raw meat, mix it with their kibble and you know get them more into the food that way and then you know i move forward from there i love that you talked about motivation first because that's something i often say as well somebody's like i want my dog to do this or i want my dog to do that well what's motivating your dog right. everything that our dogs do is based on motivation either motivated to access something pleasant motivated to prevent something unpleasant or exactly. the behavior itself is motivating and i've seen it before where there might be a photo or something like that you've probably seen this as well posted on social media and it has a dog jumping up doing protection training, but then it says something exactly opposite of what has taken place. Something like, oh, this is cruel, making a dog yeah. do this. What people don't understand, if, if it is somebody who agreed with what was written on that photo, for example, is they don't understand that when it comes to training a dog for one of these protection sports, the dogs often are bred specifically to do this sport that they're going to be trained in, and they love it. Right. Why would you want to try to put all this time and effort into a dog that doesn't like to bite yeah. a bite sleeve or doesn't like to do these obedience routines when they're working with you or like when your dogs are working with you, I've seen them. They're so happy. They're so stoked to be out there and training with you mm -hmm. that having that motivation to do it is, of course, going to be way more fun than a dog that maybe just wants to sit on the couch all day. Right. What do but, you do with a dog? But I mean, but I think it could go both ways too, because there are some dogs that aren't very fit for the sport, and people want to make them fit for the sport, and you know, and you, it could be a little unfair for the dog sometimes. So, you know, while you want, that's why you got to make sure that if if your goal is to compete in a sport, then you're gonna get the right dog for it. Now, if you got the a dog already, and you want to fold them into the, you know, fit them into this mold, and he doesn't fit you know what, why don't you just take that dog and put him into something else? If you, you know, unless you're going to, you know. So. Something that that dog enjoys. Yeah, doing. something that he enjoys doing. You don't have to do shuts and do ring or do whatever. Maybe he likes dog diving. Maybe he loves, get into that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another thing that people need to, you know, be aware of. Um, I know uh, I've talked about this in, in other, you know, interviews or whatever. Uh, when I got into the sport, and I mean, I'm very, I'm a very competitive dude. I, I, I like to win, uh, you know, and I, I got into dogs, you know, loving the dog and it, it soon turned into, I want to compete. I want to win. I want to get these titles. And what ended up happening is, is, uh, you know, it becomes a little bit of not so much for the dog anymore, more about competition. And that's, it's it kind of, it was a downfall for me. Um, until later on, I realized, you know what, like I'm getting into this, like for all the, you know, the wrong reasons. I need to go back to where I started, like, just because I enjoyed being around dogs. I didn't even know about training. I didn't care about training. All I cared about was the dogs because I love hanging out with dogs. So, um, that's why I think it's very important to enjoy whatever you're doing, just like the dog's going to be enjoying whatever sport he's going to be doing for the dog, not because of the sport that you're going to get into. And I think we just went a whole nother route.
That's cool. So, <laughs> motivation. So that's the first thing that you focus on is making sure you have something to get the dog to want to do what it is that you want them to do. And I'm sure this probably goes when you're working with basic obedience or you're working with some of your clients and things like that. So if you have a dog and that dog is really into treats, of course, you want to use treats to train with them. Or if the dog really enjoys toys, then maybe after they learn what they're supposed to do. Now, do you teach any behaviors using toys or do you use toys often as I do as a reinforcer for something the dog already knows? I, I like I like using I like playing. I like teaching a tug game from the beginning because I feel like you could uh, teach a lot of impulse control at a higher state of you know arousal level so for me that's one of the main reasons why i like using the toy can you teach obedience with of course you know if the dog loves that toy you know he's gonna be he's gonna do things for that toy so i think you could definitely use a toy i know ivan ivan uh, balavanov uses a lot of tug and that's how he teaches all his dogs with obedience he's one of the best uh shits and dog yeah, trainers not just shits and dog trainers <laughs> he's just one of the, yeah one of the best dog guys around so um i think you could definitely use you won toy. worlds what three times i have no Something clue but like uh you know definitely you know he's a standout when it comes to you know dog sports yeah and i read his book too his book is excellent yeah the schutzen book yeah so um anyways yeah so uh what were we talking about so next question that i have yeah all right when it comes to working with our dogs a common question that my audience asks is when it comes to rewards how much do you have to reward how often and can you get to a point where the dog doesn't need any rewards and one of the things that I find fascinating about competition sports in general is that we're able to take a dog and even though they learn the behaviors through the primary reinforcer and of course marker training and things like that that you're able to take them out on the field for let's look at French ring for example at the top level, it could be 45 minutes mm -hmm. and the dog is out on the field. What steps do you take to get your dog to the point where you can take them out on the field, do an entire obedience routine, not reward, not correct in any way, and still get the dog to perform throughout the entire exercise? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, so I'm gonna go back, My, I had a Connie Corso, his name was AC Slater, and I was doing Mondial Ring with him. And when I first started training, I didn't, you know, I didn't really know much about it, but I wanted to, you know, do with food and motivation and everything. So when it came to training, I really, I, I was very active trying to get him to be, you know, active for me and do all this obedience for me. So I would like make noises, you know, and come here and calling them and using food and everything. And then when I got into competition, I realized that I didn't have all this help and he was a complete different dog. So what did I do wrong? I made him reactive to me being active, right? That's how, that's how he was working for me. But then when I wasn't able to do that, he didn't do it. So now what I do is I teach the dog, I don't even show him that I have the food. Like I prep everything, I go out, I make the dog initiate everything. He pushes me to produce that reward. It's not the other way around. I'm not gonna be pushing him, you know, to do all these things for me and then I'm gonna pay him. Nah. He's going to push me enough to the point where, you know, you know, I can, you can do it by barking. So I just stand there. He looks at me. Yes, I can pay him. Uh, eventually that turns into a bark. Now you have a dog that's very active and pushing you. Now he's going to work for you so you could bring something out in hope. So you want to create hope in the dog so that, you know, so when you go into competition, he's running on hope that at some point he's going to get rewarded. And that's that opera conditioning. He doesn't know when it's coming. You know, you've conditioned him that, and, and I do it with my dog, that when a first saver comes on, right before, comp like if you, if you watch me right before I go into the competition field, I take my first saver out, I put him on a sit. I put the first saver on, that's been charged a ton. He's been paid for that a ton. He knows that when that comes on, we're training, we're working. Boom, I put it on, it's a complete different dog. You're gonna see his, you know, dopamine levels rise up and he's, he could run on a whole, he could do a whole routine. And how did you charge him for something like that? This might be something that could be very beneficial for people that are training their own service dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, where, okay, I got the vest on, now it's time to work. How do you get them charged to the first saver? Which is, uh, for people that don't know, first saver is very similar to a choke chain, right? Yeah, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a little, a little bit different. Yeah. 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 And the dogs are allowed to wear the first savers in, on in the field in Schutzen. It's a, yeah, in Schutzen. In ring, you can't. But just like that, you could also do it the other way around, where you take the collar off, and now the game starts. It's like a light switch. 
Mm. So uh, for IPO, I would, uh, you know, you have the, you have your, as a puppy, you bring them out, you're about to get ready to work, you put that thing on, mark it, pam, right away. Put it on, mark it, pam. Eventually you're gonna put it on, you're gonna wait for him, he's expecting the reward, he doesn't get it, he looks at you, mark it, pam, and so on and so on. You move forward and forward until you have a dog that's, he knows that when that thing comes on, it's, it's you it's know, time business to train time. train and play. It's business time. And yeah. we're gonna have a good time. Exactly. Which is very important when it comes to working with a dog. And that's something that I actually really like about the evolution of the protection dog training world or the sport protection training, is if you look at some of the videos from a long time ago, the dogs weren't required in a sense to be happy or to be motivated right. or to enjoy the training. And this is how things have evolved over time. So now, correct me if I'm wrong, if you go and compete in Schutzen, and the dog does not look happy and does not look motivated to be out there, then yeah. you, it's basically impossible to get a perfect score. So right? put it, like if you, your dog can look happy in the whole routine, but if you're doing say a sit out of motion, if you tell him to sit and his tail or his ears go back, you're losing a point, you're losing points. So it's, and it's not even just the, like the healing, it's the whole picture. They want it to look like the dog is very motivated. Happy you know, and excited yeah, to be happy there. and excited to be there. If, if I mean, if the dog, and it sucks because some dogs, it's not that you've you know corrected them and all that too much. Some dogs just don't wag their tail the same as other dogs. Mm -hmm. They're gonna lose points for that. Um, so you know, it's kind of a, but yeah, I mean, they de they de the picture has to be the dog has to look happy and enjoy the work. That's just you know number one when it comes to Schutzen. And for Schutzen, that was created initially years ago. I don't remember what the date was, but it was to test the integrity of the German Shepherd breed, correct? I believe it was uh, created for like uh, breeding purposes. Like if you, you know, if you could do well in this, you know, it's like a breeding test or whatever. I'm not, you know, 100% on, on all. I haven't done my, I probably should study a little more of where it started and everything. Well, but. to be honest, I don't know for sure either. But I know yeah. that, uh, like, for example, in Germany, if somebody is breeding a German Shepherd, it's almost expected that they have some sort of title on the dog to show that that particular line lives up to the integrity of right. the breed and it's able to do the job. So if you're, for example, competing with, let's say, a lab in Schutzen, they consider that an off breed because it's not the breed that was, or the, the shit yeah, yeah. routine wasn't designed after a lab, you know, yeah. same thing with French ring. I'm pretty sure French ring almost in a sense is a breed standard, right? For the Malinois. Man, I, I have, I'm, I'm guessing that's what it is. I think so. I think, I, think I mean, the yeah. thing, and, and again, uh, you know, it's different disciplines, different, I mean, uh, what, what's required in French ring, what's required in IPO are two different, I mean, it's just oranges and apples, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I don't really know what, you know, why they created this. All I know is that I love, I love the sport and uh, yeah, so. And you compete and you decoy and all yeah. these as well. And decoying is really an awesome, fun thing to do, but it's also very intimidating. It could be intense. Yeah. I mean, it, it depends. Like uh, when I got into it, um, I, I, I was hooked from the beginning. You know, I love taking bites, um, I, especially when I got into French ring. It was like, you know, because there it's the decoy versus the dog. And, you know, uh, you know, when you got a little bit of an ego. Uh, what do you mean you decoy versus the dog? Like, I mean, your know. your job as a decoy is to take points away from the dog. And, you know. When they're competing. Yeah, but I mean, in training, I mean, like when you're young and you're not really looking at like the whole training side of it. And, and you know, what what's required to build this dog. All I was looking, all I was watching was videos on, you know, YouTube at the time. And all they showed, yeah, all they showed was competitions. So I would go back and I would try to mimic all these moves that these guys are doing. Um, you know, and that's, that's why I, I really liked it. You know, when you're able to, you have a dog coming at you full speed and you can make a miss. And then he's coming back and you make him miss again. Like, I mean, that, that is me, a good feeling. Yeah, that is a good feeling, you know? So um, I wasn't able to do that very often. I'm not as good in the suit as you are. <laughs> but yeah, when the dogs would pass me, it's such a rush. Yeah. And then when they come back to try to get another bite and you're able to do a scoop and prevent them from biting, that's another amazing rush. Yeah. But for me, nine times out of 10, the dog would get the bite on the entry. <laughs> yeah. And then if they passed me, they would come back and get it almost instantly. So it would blow my mind watching some of these top decoys in the world yeah. and what they're able to do and they're taking top level dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and like in, when you like uh I forgot what was saying, but they're like when uh when you're in France, like my buddy Joe he goes to he went to France to so like big he's like every dog there is like 
a top dog. And these dudes, the decoys, they're not like, like, you know, like me that was like, I was, you know, I was at training every, every week. Now these dudes like are training every day, running it. Like they literally run a lot. Like they're, they take it serious, like a legit sport, you know? I was doing it like on the, on, you know, one, three times a yeah, week. Yeah, three times like a week. And these dudes are doing it all the time and they're pre preparing their bodies for this. You know what I mean? And they're and also working maybe 20 dogs every day. 20? Man, I, they have like 70 dogs probably that they're just like running through every, every single day. Like in France, it's like, they say it's like huge. Like there's clubs all over the place for French ring. So yeah, man. They uh, take it very seriously. Yeah, but like you see like, you know, Dosta. Uh, Hervey Mwanga, like, oh, all, you know what I mean? Like, uh, what's this, the, uh, the other dude, uh, Colbert or whatever his name is. Like, um, you know, these dudes are like, I remember when I certified in French ring, uh, Cor Corbert, I hope I'm not butchering his name. This dude was running with us, man. This dude was like a freaking, like he could run like no problem. And we were all struggling. This dude's like nothing. Like it's nothing. Yeah. Like it's nothing. I'm just like, man, these, this dude actually takes it, you know, very, very serious. It's kind of funny. I was watching some of the videos of these top decoys in French ring from France and I'm just blown away, blown away at what they're able to do. And I'm watching all these videos. I remember someone says to me, they're like, so what are you watching? And I, I explained to him what I'm watching. And I said, that's how good I want to be. And they're like, keep working at it. You'll get there. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, well, the, another thing is that these dudes start super young, man. Yes, like, you know, it's young. part of their, you know, that's part well, of what like, they do. It's like me loving basketball and watching Michael Jordan and somebody being like, keep, keep practicing. You'll get as good as yeah, him. Yeah, no, it's not, not going to happen. happen. Not yeah. going to happen. Those top level guys, the way that they do it, they're like black belt in the suit. Yeah, they're so exactly. good. It just blows my mind at how good they are. Yeah, and you're really good too. You're way better than me, and they're way better than you. Yeah, yeah. Now these dudes <laughs> are on another level for sure. It's awesome. So let's say I'm a new client of yours coming down, and I want to train my dog to do protection. So not necessarily sport. I just want my dog to be a good personal protection dog. Mm -hmm. What is the first thing you do when it comes to maybe evaluating, determining the dog's capabilities? Yeah, I mean, I, you got to you got to make sure the dog has a stable temperament first. Uh, that he's not like, you know, nervy and like, you know, looking around worried all the time. Uh, the last thing you want to do is teach a dog like that how to bite. Uh, the, the, the other thing is you're going to test the dog's drives. See if he has some prey. See if he has uh, natural aggression uh, and so on and so on. Go from there. And then you have to look at the handler. Are they going to be able to handle a dog that, you know, can be switched on and, you know, have that aggression? So you got to take all these things in consideration and see if it's going to be a good idea to teach this dog how to bite. Um, I, I usually tell people, look, you could teach him as long as you have good control of the dog and the dog knows how to bark and you know, and he could, he could look intimidating. Most people aren't going to mess with you, but you know, you always have those clients that are like, nah, I want like to go all the way through and then it's a long road, but you know, you would gotta, you, you gotta assess all the situation. Would you recommend that they do sport then? Um, no, I feel in my opinion that, you know, sport and personal protection, though they could, you know, some things could kind of mix together, but it's a complete different picture. You know, like my Connie Corso in the field was in complete sport mode. When he was behind my fence, he was always defensive and, you know, barking at everything. And he was never like that at the field. So it's, you know, it's a different scenario. Right here, we're at a sport field. And right here, you're at home taking care of my property. So you have to show them different pictures. So you recommend to most people if they do want some sort of personal protection dog that more often than not, it could be better just to teach the dog how to, in a sense, act aggressive to be a deterrent and not even necessarily teach the dog to bite. Depending on the, I mean, the thing is when you teach a dog how to bite um, and he does bite somebody, there could be, you know. It's a liability. Could, yeah, it's a, it's a li it could be a liability. Like you could get sued. I have a, I have a, and even if he doesn't bite somebody, if he gets out and he barks and, you know, the person falls and bumps their head, that's it. And if they, you know, if they see that this dog was trained in protection, you know, you can get, you know, you get sued for a lot of money. So I had a, I had somebody, uh, uh, what is it, a private investigator. He called me and he's like, hey, uh, you know, I'm just reaching out. Uh, I, I know you trained this dog. And uh, I was just wondering, like, what kind of, what kind of training you did with him? He's acting all cool with me. And I'm like... It's kind of weird that this dude's calling me. Anyways, I'm like, you know what? I only had this dog for a couple of weeks. I didn't do anything, any bite work with him. I just did obedience. Come to find out the dog bit somebody. And this 
private investigator was trying to track down everybody who worked with this dog to see who did protection with this dog so they could go after them for teaching this dog how to bite. And uh, so I think it's a, it's a big responsibility Wait, for They were gonna try to go after the trainer? Yeah, anybody that, like if you taught this dog how to bite, they could come after you basically. That's interesting, even if it's not your dog and you're just. Yeah, you're the one that taught the dog how to bite. And this dog uh, got out and bit a kid. Mm. So. Well, I find it interesting that you talked about the deterrent though, because yeah. that's something I often tell the people who do want protection training. And they come to me and they're like, I would like my dog to be a protection trained dog. I have a family, this, that, and the other. And I say, more often than not, like just teach the dog to act aggressive when there is a threat. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to do that, like you just said a few minutes ago, more often than not, that's enough to get people to back off. Yeah. I mean, dogs in general are one of the biggest deterrents when it comes to robberies and break-ins and things like that. Because even somebody trying to rob a place, they're going to choose a house that doesn't have a dog. And they're going to choose a house that is more often than not empty, yeah. people working all day, they're not home. So just by having a dog, often that's enough of a deterrent. They bark, they make noise. Yep. And most people, even if they're stealing or they're crooks or whatever, they don't wanna hurt a dog. Most people right. like dogs. So just having a dog in general. So let's say you do have somebody who comes up, he says, all right, great, let's teach my dog a, a deterrent. What mm -hmm. process would you do for something like that? Give him the mailman treatment, man. I mean, literally, you're going to walk up, create some suspicion in the dog. The dog barks. You go away. The dog wins. Little by little, he, you know, he becomes this, like, freaking monster that he, you know, at least he feels like he is. And, you know, build him up that way. Uh, that's, that's basic. That's, like, the, the short, you know, the short side right. of it. Right, and that's, that's kind of funny that you'd say the mailman, too, because that's something a lot of people run into with their dogs when they don't want them to bark. Yeah. The mailman comes, the dog barks, the mailman goes away, the dog goes, ooh, look what I just did. Yep. And now it reinforces that behavior. So that's something that has, that's very common with dog owners. They don't really fully understand the concept of predictability or the concept of pattern recognition when it comes to mm -hmm. our dogs. So if there is a certain pattern that the dog is picking up on, such as the mailman leaving, they could assume that it's their own action that's causing it and it can strengthen that, that behavior. Right. Uh, same thing with dogs being uh, taught to be aggressive. Now, do you get a lot of aggressive dog clients? Uh, I, I do. Uh, right now I'm at the point where I, I really like working with uh, puppies. Puppies. <laughs> um, no, I do. I do get some with aggression. Most of the time, it's just fear aggression, and uh, you know, it's just about building the dog's confidence and you know, letting them know that you know everything's gonna be good. Uh, real, real, real aggression. I don't. I to be honest with you, I haven't dealt with too much of that. Yeah, I don't see it very often either. That's what people don't realize either. That do like a dominant aggressive dog is very rare. Yeah, I think I've come across two. Since mm -hmm. I've been training dogs since 2012, I've come across two dominant aggressive dogs. Pretty much every single other dog, it's fear aggression. Yeah. Now, when you have a client that has a dog that's very fearful, what, what are some of the things that you do in order to build the dog's confidence? This is a common question that a lot of my supporters and followers ask about. Yeah, is, I think, I mean, again, you got to build some type of uh, motivation for the dog and get them to want to work for you uh, and then put them in, in a different situation and get them to want to work for you there. Little by little, build them up. There's different exercises you could do. Have him climb over stuff just to build up his confidence. Let him know everything's all right. When he is trying to back off into you know a spot, don't go over there and baby the dog and let him know that it's okay. That everything. Nah, we just you know make him follow through with whatever you want him to do. Release, relieve the pressure. Um, you know, and make him grow that way. Show him different situations. That's how I. That's how I do it. I just yeah, keep. I, I just do. work him through things and let him know everything's going to be okay. So it's, it's basically just building success upon more success. Yeah, exactly. So you start with something small, something simple. The dog is successful. You reward them for that. As they become more confident, then you make it maybe a little bit more challenging up until the point where they're fully confident. That's something I talk about all the time where I'm like, you know, it's not about having this submissive dog. People mm -hmm. want a submissive dog, which submission is better than fearful. You know, I don't want a fear. I'd rather have submissive over fearful, but I'd rather have confident over submissive exactly. and fearful. So once you get a puppy, first thing that you want to start doing is building the confidence, building the relationship. What is the first thing that you start doing with a puppy that you're imprinting for uh, protection sport? For protection sport, I mean, the first thing that I do is I teach them, you know, the markers that I'm going to use. What time do you, st what age do you start training them? As soon as I get them, eight weeks old. Eight weeks. Yeah. What about seven or six if you get them? Yeah, early? I mean, if, if, if uh, I usually, you know, I, I'm not a breeder, 
but uh, for example, my buddy Juan, I got a dog from him and he was working them at six weeks old. By the time I got him, the dog was like, you know, he was on and he was a complete different dog than like somebody that just hands you an eight week old puppy. Uh, so yeah, if you get them earlier, you can start them at six weeks. Uh, I, I start them at eight weeks uh, when I, as soon as I get them and I teach them the markers, you know, yes, get it, uh, good, teach them the place, like little things like that just to come and check in. Right off the bat though, I want the dog to push me to produce the reward. And how do you get them to do that? Uh, in the beginning, I just put them on leash. Why on leash? Because I don't want them roaming around all over the place just so I could block them. Just, I'm out there. If he looks up at me or glances up at me or anything, I just mark it. I say the word yes, and I produce a reward. Um, once he sees that I have something for him, then, you know, and I don't just give him like one little piece of food. Like I'll give him like one after another, after another, after another. He's checked in. He's like, oh, dang, that was, you know, that was pretty awesome. And then I could say, get it. And I could toss another treat. Then I can go the other way. He goes, he grabs that. He comes back because he wants more of what I have. That's how it starts. So get it for you is a terminal marker or what exactly is that? It's just like a go get this treat basically. Uh, and, I, and I use it a lot to get the dog away from me. Uh, more so like if I'm, if I'm working fronts, I could go, you know, here he comes. Good, good, good. Yes, I can pay him here and I can say get it. I get him away from me. And then he's coming back and I can use my cue again to get him to come in front. So good is then your, you, you kind of do it very similar to a lot of other trainers where good is your continuation marker. Duration marker. Or yeah. Duration marker. Mm -hmm. And then your yes is a terminal, terminal marker. And then get it is a terminal as well, but, but it's away sending from them me. away. Exactly. That's interesting. I, I, I like that. Yeah. So you have two versions in a sense of a terminal marker. Yeah. So the dog knows when you use one, that means the reward is going to be on you. Correct. And when you use the other, the reward may be out in the field. Yep. You do stuff like that for maybe working on focus his heel or something you have maybe a ball out in the field or yep. do you always throw it yeah yeah so uh, like with wapo instead of saying like get it it's always when the toy is already out there uh if i say go if i say go that means i'm gonna grab my toy and i'm gonna toss it mm. and so one is already in place one is gonna get tossed and then the other one is yes is with me all the time and so if you're gonna be so if i'm healing like i always use it in protection because if i call them out of the blind in, like in Shutton, call him out. I could say yes, and I can pay him with me, or I could say get it, and he can go back and bite. So you always want to make sure you have different options. You're not just, if he always feels like the reward is with the helper, then all that energy is going to go there, and it's going to be it's going to be harder for you to contain the dog next to you. Rather, if he knows that he can get something there, or he can get something with you, now he has different options and he's going to be more focused on you because he knows he can get something with you as well as out there. And when did you start teaching the puppy the bite work side or when you start imprinting them on that? As soon as I get them, uh, you know, as soon as I get them, I want to, and again, it's all with the, with the markers. So eventually, you know, you teach contact heel that's going to go into your side transport or your defensive handler for Frenching. Um, you know, if you're going to be teaching the barking, I teach barking for activation to me. Same thing, he's gonna be activating the helper to produce the sleeve or whatever, you know? So it's, it's all from the beginning, the concepts are all the same. If somebody has an older dog, let's say somebody has a dog that's a year and a half and they wanna start getting into these protection sports, is that doable at that age? A hundred percent, yeah. As long as a dog is, of course, interested in that type yeah. of training. if he has the genetic for it, yeah. So when you are working with a dog that's a little bit older, do you start the process the same way you would with a puppy? Uh, depends on what they've been doing already, uh, for sure. I, I, it, and it depends on the handle, like on the handler. If you feel that they have the capacity to, you know, learn that style of training, then you could break it down and teach them that style. Some people are just not going to get it that way. And you got to make it as easy as possible for them. So for them, I would be like, okay, we're going to place our reward here. The dog's going to be looking up here. When you're ready, you're going to say yes, drop the ball, and play, 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 play. It's a, it's a different style of training, but it gets results as well. So somebody that is somewhere else in the United States and they're interested in doing protection training, what would be your number one advice to them? Uh, number one advice would be find a club that, you know, find a club that offers that or somebody that's knowledgeable uh, in the subject and go from there. Get, get your dog evaluated and then go from there. How can someone find a club? Uh, I mean, most organizations have a page with a bunch of clubs listed. 
So now I'm familiar with the four, at least I, I feel like they're the four main ones in the United States. Are there more that I'm unaware of? So I know there's Mondial Ring, French Ring, PSA, and then Schutzen, which is now called IGP. IGP. What does that stand for? I, I thought no it was clue. IPO. And then yeah, it was I, IPO, and then it turned into IGP. I have no clue. But everyone still knows Schutzen. Yeah, Schutzen so, yeah. is what. So those are the four that I know. Are there any beyond that? Um, I mean, there's a, a, other little ones that, you know, popped up here. And there's, there's one, uh, APPDA, uh, my buddy Ty in New, New York and New Jersey. Uh, he does that. Um, then there's, uh, what was the other one? NADF or something like that. And it's, you know, similar stuff. People that, you know, try to make up, you know, make So there are sport. a few others. Yeah. What are the main differences between the four main ones? So if somebody was trying to consider one, do I do PSA? Do I do French ring? Do I do Schutzen? Do I do Manio ring? What are some of the differences between those that could maybe influence someone to choose one over the other? Um, I mean, so Schutzen requires uh, more, in my opinion, more precision. Um, so they're, they're, you know, the rules are like, they're, they're very strict. Uh, you know, your dog has to look a certain way. Um, However, for me, if I feel like it was the is the easiest sport to train on your own, like you can do more on your own, and then you can get with the club or with the with the decoy, and he could get you, you know, to the to get your dog titled. You still require a team, but I feel like you can do a lot of it on your own. Uh, French ring, most the obedience you can do it all on your own, but when it comes to protection, especially if you want to get to the higher levels, you're gonna need a decoy that knows how to move a certain way, you could show your dog different pictures, knows how to teach pivots, do all that stuff. Um, so I think that it requires a different, you know, more, a better team uh, when it comes to ring, especially a decoy. Uh, same thing with a uh, Mondio ring. And they're not as strict in the rules and obedience. So your obedience doesn't have to look as flashy and clean. As um, the Schutzen. As Schutzen. Yeah, however, um, you know, it's still, still has its uh, difficulties, especially because you need the decoys to help you out. And decoys, uh, they can be kind of expensive. So, you unless know, unless you're at a yeah, club unless unless you're at a at a club and, you know, it's going to be it's gonna, it's going to be pretty expensive to do it, especially if you're trying to get to the top level. If you're trying to get to the top level, you need top level decoys. And you're trying to, to yeah, you're traveling, you're going to seminars, you're doing all this or so you're going to spend some money. And then uh, PSA. PSA is also becoming a little bit more popular. I know you haven't decoyed in PSA. Yeah, no. uh, I was certified years ago, but I never decoyed a competition or anything like that. And PSA is also another great entry. I think the obedience in PSA, they take very seriously. I think the protection on PSA is easier than French ring or even Mondio ring, uh, but it's a great great fun sport i mean i really enjoyed it a lot of good people in there as well and that's one of the things too when you start checking out these different sports so if i was telling somebody let's say you know wherever uh let's say south carolina someone mm -hmm. in south carolina wanting to train their dog i'd say check out all the clubs and then determine based on the people yeah you know what people do you like better what training style do you like better yeah and what does your dog enjoy most? Mm -hmm. You know, if your dog really likes biting the bite sleeve and loves to track, shuts it all the way, you know? Yeah. If your dog really enjoys biting that bite suit, you know, then maybe one of the other yeah. ones might be a better choice. I always like to do what the dog really enjoys. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, French ring, I, I do enjoy talking about French ring because it is so challenging. I like that you talked about the fact that you have to have strong decoys to mm -hmm. help with it. Now, why is that? Why is it that the decoy work is so big when it comes to French ring and having certain level decoys in order to get to the top level is very important in comparison to maybe... I mean, in, in any sport, whoever's working your dog uh, has to, you know, they got to know what they're looking at. Their timing has to be good. They got to know when to, you know, correct, when to reward, when to do all that stuff. So in all the sports, however, when it comes to, you know, French ring, you know, teaching the object guard when to you know when to give when to come in when to step out when to you know to me that requires somebody that not only can is athletic but has the mind of a, of a trainer and knows when to mark knows when to you know when to reward and all that so and again for all of them but i think for french training because of the you know the object guard the search you know on one of them you're teaching the dog to stay on the object on the other one you're teaching the dog to follow the decoy and you know and not get meters away which is the escort so it's like 
man, it's so many different things. You know, the defensive handler, he's supposed to stay next to you until the, the decoy hits you. He can't bite. Uh, the face attack. On one of them, he recalls. On the other one, he has to stay there uh, for the gun attack. He has to guard the guy when the guy tries. So there's just so many things when it comes to protection in Frenching that to me, it's like, you know, it's, it's a whole different ball game. And protection in Schutzen is literally an escape bite, a re-attack, a back transport, uh, another attack, and then a long bite, you know? It's, it's, you know, it's very minimal compared to French ring. I tried uh, with WAPO, because you could go from Schutzen 3 to a French ring 3, so I crossed over and competed in a French ring 3 just to see where we were at, because I started him in French ring, but he works at such a, you know, he gives 120% every, for everything that when we went to French ring, it was a 45-minute routine. He was done. Like, there was three exercises left, and he, I had to pull him because he couldn't breathe anymore. He really? was like, yeah, he was just done. And he has a, a breathing problem. Uh, but he can't really focus uh, when he can't really focus on breathing. So he just gassed out. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah it's a long time. 45 minutes is no And then when it's joke. hot, oh, man, it's ridiculous. And, and during that 45 minutes, they're doing the obedience, they're doing the agility, and then they're doing the protection yep. as well. And like you said, there's a lot of different protection exercises that they have to do in the sport. Now, with Schutzen, we have obedience, agility. No, it's, no, a, no, no, no. Uh, it's tracking, obedience, obedience and protection. That's it's right. all split into three. So each uh, routine is going to come out to, like, you know, the, the obedience routine, I believe, is like eight eight to 10 minutes or something like that. They do one there. at a time. They yeah, one at a time. Out. And it's also hard because literally if you don't pass one, you don't get your title. As to where in French ring, it's all together and you could miss a couple exercises and you could still pass. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it has its benefits. And I was know. thinking agility too because they have the A-frame and the jumps. Yeah, yeah that's and the part retrieves. of obedience, yeah. So retrieves is a big one too. So retrieval training uh, that could be worthwhile to talk about because you can do retrieval training. So a large portion of my audience, they are trying to learn how to train service dogs as well. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that's important to keep in mind too. If you're training a service dog, so you've trained some service dogs or have you? Uh, here and there, not, not too much. Not too many. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, uh, so with service dogs though, a lot of times people think that service dog training is very difficult. And what I tell people, it's really not, it's really not that hard. It's more about having the right dog, of course, and then having the time and the patience because there is no precision, there is no grading. It's like, can the dog simply do the job? Yeah. And one of the jobs that is required by a lot of service dogs is retrieval training. So yeah. somebody's in a wheelchair, they drop something, the dog has to be able to pick it up and hand it to them. Now doing the Schutzen level retrieval training, I think is very transferable over to service dog training. Would you agree? Um. Yes and yes and yes and no. All right. So I mean, like you said, when it comes to service dogs, they don't ask for like a certain criteria. You just got to pick the thing up, right, and mm -hmm. hand it to them. In IPO in Schutzen, the dog has to go out fast, come back fast, be very straight, right in the center. He can't chew the dumbbell, um, and he's supposed to out it as soon as you tell him. So there's a lot of uh, you know links to this chain that you put together as to where in. The service dog, you know, he just needs to pick it up. However, here the dog is in drive. He's in competition as to where a service dog, he's maybe out of, you know, out of drive. He's just hanging out and you drop something and he has to pick it up. To me, that's super impressive if you could get a dog to pick something up for you every single time uh, by pointing at it or whatever. Uh, so maybe you could educate me on this a little bit. Um, well, I learned retrieval training when I went to the Tom Rose School. And Tom Rose founded his school basically on, not on, but I mean, he, his intentions was to be able to train students to go out, compete and win. Yeah. And he was a competitor in Schutzen back in the seventies and eighties. And I think even now he wants to compete again. I'm yeah. not a hundred percent sure. So don't quote me on that, but I learned his retrieval training process for Schutzen. And then I was able to just take that and transfer it over to service dog training yeah. because the way I looked at it, if you could teach a dog to do a competitive retrieve, where they have to run out, like you said, but now. But it's different times, you know. Drive, you're talking. Yeah. He's he's training dog, dogs for retrieval back then to now. It's it's just it's different times now. They want you know more speed, you know, way more. You know, the, it's just the level that they want this, the precision that they want this retrieve to look like is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I always lose points on it, so that's what <laughs> I'm saying. Is 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 different, 
yeah, you know, it could be the same. You could teach to retrieve this the same way, but for what if you and it depends on the le level. If you just want to get a title, yeah, I'm sure you could teach them the same exact way. But if you want to compete and be at the high level, you got to go a different route. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to go fast? What is your training process? Well, usually the problem's not going out is, you know, cuz you throw it, so they're, you know, they're they want to go out and grab that thing uh to bring it back. Uh, right now, like the, what people are doing right now, like uh, Marco. So I know Marco and Sarah, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I read this book called, uh, oh, what's this book? It's a Green Schutzen book by uh, Peter Shirk, I believe it is. Anyways, he teaches to, he teaches dogs to, um, to grab two toys at the same time, right? So he'll go like, he'll have two little, two balls and he'll, I mean, two little squishy toys and he'll say, grab this one and then grab this one and come and play with me. Grab this one, grab this one, and come play with me. And then later on, he'll like separate them, and the dog will go grab this one, and then this one, and then come play. Eventually, you put one in the front, one in, you know, one right behind it. He goes out, he grabs it, grabs this one, comes back. Now you could throw one, and the dog's not only gonna go out fast, but he's gonna come back fast because there's not only something out there for him, but there's something over here for him at the same mm -hmm. time. So he teaches the dog to go out and come back fast. That right there is required in, in shuts in. Um, and then you could break the other side, the holding and do all that. You could do it separate. But there's literally a mark to let the dog know that he's not going to drop the dumbbell. He's going to take another toy with the dumbbell in his mouth. So they teach the dog to go out and come back fast. That's how you create speed. That's interesting. That's what, this is like what I love about dog training. What I, I try to teach people that I work with is the most important thing is understanding the signs. If you can understand the science, then you can come up with different techniques that could work. So like that is fascinating to me because now the dog is excited to run out mm -hmm. and then the dog is excited to come back in the other direction. Yep. And I might be butchering it a little bit, but like the concept, that's what it is. I just started with my puppy. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of what it is. It's there's something out there for you and there's something over here for you. And you have learned to get these two things in your mouth it and be possessive sense. over it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, crap, I had something else I was about to say based on that but it's what it's it's the concept that i try to do with everything so for example um now i haven't competed in akc obedience it's one of the requirements when you go through the tom rose school where mm -hmm. i was you know a student and eventually an instructor at and we have to do all the akc obedience routines in order to graduate and they get tested there at the school so they have to do the uh, the novice open and then if you're doing the master class or the master program then you have to do the utility routine mm -hmm. which the utility routine is insanely difficult it's very challenging and one of the requirements is a send out to directed jumps so you send the dog the dog has to run to the end of the training building you say sit they have to sit and then the evaluator tells you which jump for the dog to do and there's two jumps one on each side so you have to go jump and the dog jumps it they do a sit front and then they flip in the heel position when I train that routine, I never would send the dog and then have the dog do the jump one right after another because mm -hmm. then the dog starts anticipating the jump and then it slows them down. So then they don't want to come. So another one of my buddies, for example, he's learning how to train dogs. So I'm evaluating or critiquing his training videos. And so he sent me one on recall that he's doing. And as the dog is coming in, the dog's now, he's not competing. So mm -hmm. the dog being crooked and things like that really yeah. doesn't matter that much, but the dog is very far away. And then he's taking, he's using his terminal marker and he's throwing the ball over the dog's head. Now, what do you think that might end up doing for the dog's recall? Slowing him down. Slowing yeah. it down. Exactly. And why would it slow it down? Because you're going against what you're, you're, you're adding, you're adding an incompatible behavior or, you know, reward placement to what you really want. You want them to come fast, but you're giving them a reward behind. He's going to go, yo, why am I going fast to you when I know you're going to toss the reward behind? Me? Exactly. And that's exactly what I said. But now I might do something like that if I'm teaching the dog a down on recall, because then I want the dog to down very quickly and think about the reward coming the opposite direction. So then he downs, but then that could also slow down the recall too, because now the dog's going, oh, you're going to tell me to down. So that's the beauty I think about competition is being able to take something that you want the dog to do and not only have them do it, yeah. but have them do it at a level that's beyond everybody else. Yeah. yeah I, we, I just did a, a, a little live uh, Instagram thing with uh, my buddy, Forrest, Forrest Mickey. Oh yeah. And, he's awesome. Uh, and he talked about the send away man and he broke it down in a way that you're like, whoa, that makes sense. So anybody watching, 
sure you guys uh, check that yeah, out. Yeah, Forrest Mickey rocks. I mean, yeah. I, I love his work. I'm going to uh, put that on my on my YouTube, actually, because it's just on Instagram right now, but I'm going to put it on my YouTube, man. But it was like, everybody that was watching was sending me messages like, yo, that was awesome. Like, the way he broke it down, he's just such a good teacher that you're like, it makes sense. Yeah, I agree. I think he's an exceptional teacher. <clears throat> Michael Ellis, I know we were talking mm -hmm. about him earlier as well. Uh, who are some of the dog trainers that you've looked up to in your career? Um, I mean, I mean, there's, there's so many of them, uh, and for different, for different things. Uh, but for sure, I mean, Michael Ellis is, you know, Bart, Bart Bellin, um, even though I've never trained with him personally, but just like the content and like mm -hmm. the things that I've gotten from people that have gone to see him. Um, who else? When it comes to like, uh, Ivan, of course. Yeah. Ivan, you know, Ivan's one of the top trainers, um, uh, there's uh Mike so when it came to IPO Mike Lorraine I learned some of my you know my bark and hold stuff uh Joseph when it came to like some French ring stuff he, he taught me a lot of stuff Forrest is one of my mentors like that's who I really you know I could you know rely on when I need some some help uh so I learned a ton from him still learning from him so can, you, sure. can you talk a little bit about what he explained in the send yeah, out? Yeah, so uh, so what's the send out first for the audience so they know? Well, the send out is uh, basically you. There's a send out in in every sport that I, that I that I that I've been in uh, French ring, Mondial ring, and IPO, and they're different for 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 ring sports. Uh, you basically you're at a, at your start line. You send your dog. Once he goes past a certain point, you recall your dog. He comes back to you. So he's he's just supposed to run straight. Uh, in IPO, he's supposed to run straight, and when he gets to the end of the field, the judge will tell you to down your dog, and you're supposed to down him, and he's supposed to down. Uh, so that's kind of what it is. Uh, the the rough, you know, the rundown of the way he kind of explained it was, they basically they always have a toy out there, and they teach the dog there's going to be something there for you, forever. Uh, in a separate uh, session, you're going to be teaching also the dog to down to down, to down, to down, and you're going to pay them. It could be through a game or whatever. Anyways, at some point, you're going to shorten up a little bit. Instead of sending them from a long distance, you're going to shorten up. You're going to send them. The dog's not going to find anything, and you're going to tell him to down. And he's going to, you know, he's you've never done this before, so he's going to be like, what? So you might have to give him a couple more cues. Down, down. Eventually, he'll do it. Yes, boom, I, you pay him with you. So he's like, oh, shoot. That was, you know, pretty awesome. Then you go back, you send them, put a toy out there. And again, you try it. You send them, no toy. You tell them to down. It might take a couple times. Eventually, he's going to figure out, you know, there's nothing here. I'm going to down. Boom. So then you give the, now the dog's going to understand. When he, when he tells me to down is because there's not, nothing's going to be over here for me. That's, the, I've already learned that through experience, through trial and error. I'm not going to find anything here. And the only other option is to down so he can reward me down there. Or you can come back and give him room service and pay him in a down position. Um, but, to, but the way, again, I don't know how to explain things the way Forrest knows how to explain things. So, but that was kind of like the, the rundown of kind of how it went through. And eventually you have a dog that goes out super fast. And when you tell him to down, he turns around and faces you on a down position because he knows that there's nothing out there. Everything is with you. That's interesting. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I've always, every time I've done the send out, very similar to that, I start really close to where I want the dog to run. Mm -hmm. I, I first start with food, and then I will continue to increase distance and keep sending the dog to the food up until the point where they know that there's food out there, and then I switch it to a toy. And then just like you said, every time I send them, there's always a reward, almost every single time, unless it's time to stay down. But I like how you explain to where the down means there's no toy out there. The toy's back this way, but you probably you do way more where the toy's out there. Yeah, of course. In the beginning, you got to make sure you create passion, and you know, for running, for going forward, and that's the first thing that you want to do. Some people would like to teach with a touchpad, and some dogs love to run to a touchpad. However, you know, if you create, you know, direct like the reward is going to be right there. Make sure you go, 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 go. Uh, you know, you definitely get more speed out of your send away. Heck yeah. So we're going to be doing a protection series, which I'm really excited about. Are there some things that you might be able to tell the audience, little teasers of what we're going to be doing? Um, mainly, you know, how to create some more motivation in the dog when it comes to, you know, biting, uh, biting the toys and all that. Uh, maybe teaching them some impulse control, how to stop, you know, right in, you know, midair when the dog's trying to bite you, tell him done, he's supposed to stop and then he's going to bite. 
uh, how to bark at the toy, how to bark, when to bark, when not to bark. Uh, all these are little things that we, I think we, we're going to cover and uh, should be good. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. So we'll put a link in the description so people will be able to find you as well. Definitely, guys, check out his YouTube channel. It's freaking awesome. He has a lot of great stuff on there. Thanks, it's going to be worth your while. Make sure you subscribe as well. Thanks for watching, everybody. Any last save rounds? Uh, man, enjoy, enjoy your dogs. Get out there uh, and play with them. Have some fun. Heck yeah, take lots of photos and videos. All right, everybody, thanks again for watching. Please make sure you like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, go to his channel, like, subscribe there as well, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.